turn that I can not see. Bigger than all the giants of fear and unbelief, God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all my hang-ups, bigger than anything, God is bigger than any mountains that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all my problems, bigger than all my fears, God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all my questions, bigger than anything, God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Well, good evening and welcome. Greetings to each one in Christ's name. We're glad to be together here and looking forward to what God has for us. So thank you for being here and your attendance and your prayers, I'm sure, are much appreciated as well. Are there any announcements to be shared tonight? I don't know that I have any, except invite you to come tomorrow evening again at 7.30 and continue to pray. So are there any other announcements to be shared tonight? Okay, if not, I usually like to just have a little bit of scripture here, somewhat as an opening. I told um, John, we're thankful to have John and his wife Sharon here with us tonight. I told him I'm not going to be introducing him because I don't really know him. So I guess I'll let him share with us um, if he cares to do that so we get to know him better. I don't know that there's um, probably a fairly strange congregation probably to you, Brother John, isn't it? <laughs> and um, probably some that we've seen, seen each other before but not really connected and so it's special to be able to connect here, especially around God's Word. And as I thought of th thought a little bit of that, I recently was reading in John six, and why I wanted to ask the question: Why are you Why are you here tonight? Why do you come to church? Why um, Why are you here tonight? And I'm not going to read a lot here, but just to give a little bit of the story, I guess they had just as there was this great multitude that followed Jesus. And it was time to eat. And so we know the miracle that happened there where this young lad had five loaves and two fishes and how Jesus blessed that and and break um, and passed it out. And I think there was this story here. There was 12 baskets left over. And so they were well fed. And so they went into this into the sea and and the, they had a, a storm. They crossed over the sea. Anyhow, the day following, and we'll maybe break in here in verse 22 of John chapter 6. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the, that one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. So here they were kind of observing, well, where is, where is Jesus? Where, where did this man, where did he get to? And so they kind of did some observing here and said, well, he's, he must be going over to the other side there. And verse 23, how be it, there came other boats from Tiberias nigh into the place where they did eat bread. After that, the Lord had given thanks. When the people thereof, therefore, saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? So here they were kind of seeking, they were seeking Christ again. And Jesus kind of rebuked them a little bit, I would say, because he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. So here he's saying, you basically got a free supper last night, and that's what you're after. You know, that's, you really um, got your bellies filled, and so that's what you're looking for. You're looking for some, some physical, basically physical blessings. 
Labor not for the meat, and he goes on in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him, for him hath God the Father sealed. And I was wondering, you know, I sometimes I'm kind of thinking, especially if, um, and, and I know this probably happens more, quite a, quite a bit in maybe in other churches, there's a lot of social isn't there a lot of social gatherings? There's a lot of social things done for kind of to draw people, um, draw people to church. And maybe that's why people go and, and they might go for that reason. And I hopefully they can they can be filled and they can receive more than that. But I trust we're not here just for. Well, one way I, we could think of it. And as we go to jail service, I don't know if they still do this or not. But at one time they would get, could we say, brownie points? If they went to chapel, if they came to chapel, they got I don't know, they got a little bit extra, maybe privileges. And so that was that was kind of a reason that many of them came. And you could kind of pick you could generally see which ones came for that purpose, too. They were they were usually sitting in the back of the room and they were um, yeah joking and carrying on. And and so they they were they basically came for brownie points or another. I remember I haven't done these building or business there was some small business expos we would go to and one of the one of the perks or one of the one of the things that as a business that we had to have at our booth was was to had to have a drawing for something and that was kind of their way to get people to come to these that was kind of an attraction well you could soon see who was there to there was people going down the roads and they had they actually they brought their they didn't just write their name on this piece of paper. They actually came prepared. They either had these address labels, um, the address labels. They would come along, peel them off, and just go down the row and stick them on. They were there for the for the drawings. There was even some that had these stamps, where you know your address stamps, and they would come along and they would just go down the row and they would stamp. And once they were clear through, you know they were they were gone. They were there to for physical for to get see what they could get for good things. But I trust as we're here tonight. That we came and and as we would if we could read on here well maybe we will we'll, we will read on here verse 28 then said they unto him what shall we do that we might work the works of God and and well maybe skipping down talking about the bread of life so Jesus brings this you know he had, he had said well you came for you came for for food you that's that's what you came for is is to be filled then he then he kind of takes this an interesting parallel here he takes it to the bread of the bread of life. Verily, verse 32, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Not a not a physical, something that fills us um, physically, but the, fills us spiritually, gives us life. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Talking about himself. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So now they're curious here. Let's 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 have some of this. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. So as we're here tonight and what God has for us through our brother, let's be open. Let's be hungry spiritually and God will, God will fill us. So I think with that, we will stand for prayer. And I'm going to ask Brother John to come forward for prayer before the message. Dear God, we stand before you again here. We we just invite you here with us. Lord, we know that you have promised to be with us, and we just ask that you would continue to direct this service. We pray for um, your Holy Spirit in each of our lives, especially Brother John. Lord, we just pray that you would speak to him. May he speak without fear or favor of men. He would speak the words you've laid upon his heart. Lord, help us as, as we have here for for blessings, for spiritual blessings, I trust that we would be open to be filled with your word. We know your word provides for all our needs, whatever they may be. So, Lord, if there's hurting ones here tonight, if there's needs here tonight, we pray that you would just fulfill fill those needs, that those with needs could look to you, be blessed, encouraged, whatever you have for us. Again, Lord, we just invite you here with us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. Thank you, brother.
Thank you, Brother Ethan. Welcome to everyone here tonight. We extend Christian greetings to you. Thank you, Brother. The Bible says if you give someone a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, you will not lose your reward. Thank you. So, uh, as Brother Ethan was sharing with us, he was talking a bit about the reason that we're gathered together. What, what is motivating us to gather together like this? And um, in my experience, there are several, several reasons that we gather together like this. Um, but one is uh, simply to hear the word preached, to have our hearts refreshed. And another is that we might be equipped for the work of what? The ministry. And is there an opportunity for ministry around us? Do you see opportunities for ministry? Did you see any today? We live in a hurting world, do we not? We live in a world full of pain. And so many times we go through the world, we're kind of like in our own little world, in the world, and we fail to be moved with compassion towards those who don't know our Redeemer. And so part of the reason that we meet together, I think one of the primary reasons that the church meets together, and so much the more as we see the day approaching, is that we want to be equipped for the work of the ministry. And so my prayer for the congregation here is that as we share the word, that the word might speak to your heart and might bring comfort to you. And it might also allow you to then comfort other people in the same way that it has comforted your heart. And the Holy Spirit wants to do that through his inspired word. Uh, we can turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. And Brother Ethan said maybe I should give a little introduction. There's not much to know about me as a person other than that I'm as um, a brand plucked from the fire. And maybe I'll share a little more of my testimony later in the week. We'll see how the Lord directs. But uh, God saved me. Um, when I was 11 years old, I gave my heart to the Lord. Very much aware of my need of salvation. And I remember the night that I gave my heart to the Lord. I walked outside, and I'd been carrying this, this burden of guilt in my life, in my heart. And I walked outside, and I looked up into the heavens, and I felt like my feet were going to uh, come off the ground. Uh, do you remember that? you remember Pilgrim? Uh, Christian and Pilgrim's Progress, when that burden rolled off his back. Do you remember when your burden rolled off your back? Do you remember that? I see some of you shaking your heads. Uh, do you remember that? Do you think back on that day? And does it fill your heart with gratitude when you think of the difference that Jesus has made in your life? We need to reflect. We need to stop and we need to remember the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. It's been huge in my life. I have a lovely wife, Sharon, who agreed to marry me uh, 39 and a half years ago. Now, that's longer than a few of you at least have been married. How many here, just to get a little sense, how many of you have been married for 40 years? Okay, okay, very good. We have a few here that have been married for 40 years. How many of you have been married for two years or less? Okay, very good. <laughs> Excellent. And I see a whole lot of young men up here in the front uh, row. Uh, have you ever thought about being married? <laughs> I mean, is it somewhere on your radar? Yeah, but actually tonight we're going to talk a little bit about marriage. Uh, Brother Ethan said, I, I asked him if he had any particular topics I should maybe share on. He said, well, maybe family, um, however the Lord directs. So we're going to think about marriage, family, church over the next couple of nights as, or as the Lord directs. Uh, but I've been blessed for 39 and a half years to have a loving wife, a help meet in my life. And it's just been an incredible journey. Uh, not that it's always been, not that she has always had an easy life with me, but I have. she's been an amazing help me in my life. And we've been blessed. I don't know how to introduce my family. Okay, and here's why. Let me explain why I don't know how to introduce my family. Um, I say we have five children. And when I say we have five children, I mean that we have five children living on this side of eternity. Okay, does that make sense? And uh, they're all married at this at this point, and seeking to serve the Lord. And we, we count ourselves very blessed. Um, we have, and again, 12 grandchildren on this side of eternity. 
and expecting our 13th one uh, when Brian and Michaela plan to have a little one in May, in May, I think next month. Yeah. And uh, we have a, a little grandson who uh, died prematurely. And, uh, you know, I think about Job. Uh, Job had uh, thousands of, of uh, camels and sheep. What do you have? 7,000 sheep and uh, I forget, 5,000 camels or something like that. 500 donkeys and 500 oxen, let's just say. And then we come to Job 42 and he has twice as many of everything. And he also had how many sons? Seven. And how many daughters? Three. Really? Why didn't God double his sons and his daughters? Because his first seven sons and three daughters were still living. They're human beings, so they're eternal. They're just in heaven and not on earth. And so sometimes I think about that, and I'm like, wow. How many grandchildren do I have? How many children do I have? God is good. Let's open our Bibles to Colossians. And uh, Brother Ethan asked me, he said, do you have a topic or a theme? And I said, you know, I don't. I don't really. I hadn't really thought about it up to that point. Life has just been like uh, in a fast lane. How many of you struggle to get everything done that you want to get done in a day's time? Okay. So it's sort of a human problem, is it not? And I think we kind of brought it on ourselves. We're so efficient at doing everything. We set our goals so high. We, we reach for the stars every morning. We get up and we want, we want to accomplish a lot. And one of the things that we I want to learn in my life is that uh, the gospel is a message about restored relationships. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And relationships take time. And I think that maybe um, we need to stop and think a little bit more about whether or not we're giving the time and the energy to relationships that we ought to. And so I want us to think about these meetings in the context of uh, restored relationships, okay? Restored relationships are hard work. How do we know that? Because Jesus went to the cross to accomplish that for us, to make it possible for us to live in restored relationships. And so Colossians chapter 3, think about the first four verses for the meetings coming up. And I don't know that we'll always center around these verses, but there's some concepts here that we want to think about. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. <laughs> is that not all what we long for? And that's why we gather together. That's why we spend time around God's word. That's why we spend time on our knees praying together as the church and in our private lives. That's why we seek after the Lord. What does Peter tell us? He says that faith is, is good. We need faith. We can't go anywhere without faith. But it needs to be bringing us to maturity, to a perfection. He, wants to, he, wants, he says to the Colossian church, he says, I want to present every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, perfect. <laughs> I like that. That means um, emotionally, intellectually, and, and morally mature in Christ. In Christ is the theme that we want to think about. What does it look like to be in Christ? He wants to have, uh, he wants, God wants our time together to be building within us um, virtue. So Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, what is virtue? Someone want to tell me? When you think about virtue, what do you think about? How about moral excellence? Does that make sense to you? Just say that together. Moral excellence. Let's do it a little better. Moral excellence. That means that we have a strong inner conviction about what God is calling us to. And so tonight we want to think about moral excellence in our marriages. And so we're going to just drop down here through this chapter a little bit. We're going to pick up a few verses. Let's drop to verse 11. He says that it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. What is it that matters? Christ in all. Christ in all. 
and in all. He's saying that Christ is everything to you, that he is your passion. He is the one thing that you live for. He's the one thing that you're willing to die for. Is that important in marriage? What is Paul setting the stage for here? He has gone through a list of things that if you're a follower of Jesus that you have to put out of your life. Put it off, put it off, put it off, put it off. And he says, now here's something that you have to understand is that your passion, your love has to be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You have to put on some things. And we would notice here, we're not going to take time to read all of this, but we will notice some of the things that he puts, that he tells us to put on. And one of them is in verse 15, we must put on the peace of God. And we must let it rule in our hearts. How many of you ever had time in your life that you can think back to and say, you know what? I didn't let the peace of God rule in my heart. And what happens when the peace of God doesn't rule in our hearts? Our emotions kind of take over, don't they? And words kind of come out that sometimes are kind of like sharp or harsh. Do you ever have that happen? Uh, yeah. Yeah, me too. And you feel grieved when that happens, don't you? It's called repentance. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I say my children, the things that my children really feel strongly about and develop convictions about growing up are the things that their father had enough sense of humility to come and ask forgiveness for. And my wife too. Very important in a marriage to be able to say, I am sorry, will you please forgive me? Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or do, deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Now, one of the things that I just want to point out here is, that, is this simple truth, that the Word of God is so simplistic. Did you notice that in just a few phrases, Paul tells the church at Colossians how to have a God-honoring marriage. Do you notice that? And you can take this small passage of scripture and actually put it to practice in your life. And guess what? You have a marriage that fulfills the purpose for which marriage was designed by God. And what was the purpose for which marriage was designed by God? It is a metaphor of what? Christ in the church, Christ's love for the church. Exactly. And so it's like a mirror, all right? So when you look into a mirror, if you were to go home tonight and you look into the mirror and you've seen a camel face, what would you think? There is something dreadfully wrong. Is that right? Because the mirror is supposed to reflect the likeness. Your marriage is to reflect the likeness of Christ's love for his bride. That's what it's about. So your marriage is a billboard to the world to say, ah, there's a loving father in heaven who gave his son to redeem a bride for himself. And when people watch you interact as a husband and wife, it is to put that picture, an accurate picture of the father's love, of Christ's love for the church on their hearts. That is the purpose. So I want to ask you tonight, those of you who are married, I want you to ask you, um, how would you rate your marriage? If you were to rate it, is it okay if I, if I erase this? Yeah. Okay, it's a wonderful verse. I actually found inspiration sitting back there reading that. So we might put it back up there later this week, who knows? But if, if you were to rate your, your marriage um, one to 10, with one being... Uh, <clears throat> not very satisfactory, and 10 being amazing, where would you, where would you uh, rate your marriage? I'm not going to ask you to say it out loud, but just I want you to think about it. I want you to have a number in your mind. Okay, you got that? Okay, what would have to change? Let's just say that you said it's a seven. Go easy on you. What would have to change in your marriage before it would be a 10? 
Do you have any ideas in your mind right now? Just freeze that idea in your mind right now. And let me ask you this question. Does it have something to do with a need for you to change, or does it have something to do with something you want to see your spouse change? You got the question. Did you follow it? The answer to that question reveals to your heart whether or not you understand the principles that we just read here in Colossians chapter 3 regarding our responsibilities in marriage. That makes sense to you? The The answer to that question is very important. Very, very important to having a successful, God honoring marriage that accurately reflects the love that Christ has for his bride. Extremely important. I have had the privilege over the years to um, talk with a lot of people who were struggling in their marriage, and it's amazing. You see these young men up here and these young ladies up here, and I hope you all have the opportunity, if God leads you into marriage, to experience that. It's, It's an incredibly sanctifying work that God does through marriage to the Christian's heart. I have seen people who marry and within a few years they're they're making uh, comments like I simply don't feel like my needs are being met in this marriage. Um, I've seen people make comments like um, I'm not getting out of this marriage what I always expected a marriage would do for me. Do you see the you see the the self-focus, the self-centeredness of that, of those kind of comments? And while some of us would probably not actually say things like that, the question is, do I think things like that? And do I live out my marriage covenant with expectations that project that on my spouse? Let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter five. It's difficult to talk a lot about marriage without coming back to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Actually, before we do that, let's think about, go ahead and turn there to Ephesians chapter 5. But let's think about the problem for a minute. And the problem all starts in a garden of all places. Marriage is like a garden, is that right? And did you know the Garden of Eden, according to Ezekiel, had walls about it and a gate? And so does a marriage. It's a garden. It's the walled garden. And you're the gatekeeper, particularly the men are the gatekeeper in a marriage. You're the gatekeeper of your garden. And you have an incredible responsibility. And we go back to Genesis where it all started, the principle of first mention. You go back to where it started. What was God's purpose for marriage? His purpose was that you would have two people, a man and a woman. The idea here is two people who are moving towards each other, and becoming one what? Flesh. One in heart, soul, emotion, one even intellectually. You ever notice people have been married as long as maybe we think? You older brothers here, do you know that you you can almost finish what your wife's going to say? You know, if you live with a woman for 39 and a half years, I know what she's going to say the minute she starts speaking. It's just the way it is. We're so much one I cannot imagine life without my wife. I cannot imagine it. It would be devastating to my world if my wife wasn't a part of it like she is. So that's God's design. And God's design is for the man to exercise his role in um, loving, loving headship. All right? Instead of spell all these words out, because I'm not a very fast speller, I'm just going to put some initials up here. And for the, for the wife, uh, what, what, what might that stand for? Willing submission. Loving headship, willing submission. What was it? Loving, willing, do it again. Loving headship, willing submission. That's it, right there. That is God's design. That's the way God created man and woman to function 
to advance his purposes in the world. It's the only way that his purposes can be advanced in the world. And we know what happened. What happened? Satan came along and he started asking some questions. Not a big deal, right? It's a big deal if you listen. It's a big deal if you let those questions enter your mind and you start resonating with those questions. And what happened What happened when um, Satan was asking those questions? Where was Adam at? Was he in the garden? Yeah. But he does, he does what most of us tend to do. He became um, indifferent to what was going on. He was there. And he was punished for the fact that he was there. He did not say, wait a minute, that is not what God's word says. He didn't say that. He just allowed this conversation to take place between the serpent and his wife. Uh, you would think that he would um, grab a stick and chase that serpent out of the garden. That's what he should have done. But he was indifferent. And Eve was deceived. And as a result of that, God says, you know, Adam, for you, you're going to have to toil. You're going to have to work hard. The land isn't going to bring forth what it should. Your life is going to be filled with sorrows. There's going to be pain in your life to remind you of the fact that you didn't take your responsibility as a man, as a loving head over your wife. And to the wife, what does he say? There's going to be sorrow in childbearing. And your desire is going to be to your husband, but he is going to what? To rule over you. And I had a young sister tell me one time, she says, that that means that I am going to just naturally love my husband for all I'm worth. And I said, I don't think that's what it means. If you go to the very next chapter and God is speaking to Cain and he says the very same thing, that sin is crouching at the door and it's, it's desirous to rule over you, to have you. And so the, the part of the curse is this, is that God has ordained men to be loving, the loving head in a relationship, and for sisters to be willingly submissive to the authoritative role that God has called men to. But our fallen nature as sisters is that we tend to want to take that position, to not submit to it. And so you have to choose every day. You have to choose to be a willingly submissive spouse to your husband. Very critical that we understand that it's something that we willingly choose to do. So we have this incredible problem. If we don't, um, if we don't give ourselves to this, what happens? Men become either indifferent or they become controlling. Mm hmm. Yeah. They become angry because they're not getting their expectations are not being met. They become angry about it and they try to control the situation to try to control their marriage, to try to control the family. And how does that work? Does that work? No, that does not work. And for a wife who does not willingly submit to her husband, a wife can become very uh, quietly manipulative or just um, brazenly disrespectful. We can do that. Do you sisters believe that you have the potential to do that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you do, because of who we are. It's just like our natural instinct to become that. And I've seen that. And I've seen the havoc that it wrecks in marriage relationships. And so what is God's solution? What is God's solution? His solution is that we take humble ownership of our brokenness. Um, that we take responsibility. Each of us take responsibility for our role, our God-given role in marriage. That we do not become, that we refuse to become a people who try to control other people, but that we choose to love. And you say, well, I, don't, I don't try to control anyone. Um, really? This, this is about 
being brutally honest because God knows everything about us already. Is that right? And we believe that. We're convinced that God, there's nothing hid before God. So I'm just going to ask you brothers that are married. How many of you were married, are married right now? Okay. How many of you, I didn't count those hands, but I got a sense a little bit. How many of you have ever given your wife the silent treatment? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? How many of you have ever done that? Of those of you who are married. Okay. So just so we know, that is a control issue, right? That is not love. That is control. Uh Uh-huh. And for the wife to do that, that is manipulation, where we just simply don't talk. We don't communicate. We hope that the, the husband or the husband hopes that the wife gets it. We just want them to get it, you know. We're not going to talk to them, but we hope that they get it. We're upset about something. We hope that it bothers them deep enough that they ask what's going on, what's bothering you. But it's, it's, a, it's a form of control that we don't want in our marriage relationships. And so what we want to look at tonight is um, what Paul does. We're in Ephesians 5. And here's what I want, here's what I want to point out. It just means a lot to me, to all of us here this evening. Uh, Paul, again, in, in chapter 5 of Ephesians, he says this. He, again, he goes right through the same, the same, almost exact same thing that he says in Colossians chapter 3, which is a little different wording. He goes in verse 9 and 20, verse 19 and verse 20. Let's, let's back up, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be what? Filled with what? The Spirit. And if you're filled with the Spirit, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just just think about this a little bit. He says almost the exact same thing in Colossians. So why is it so important? Why does he preface everything he says about love and respect? Why does he preface it with the need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Where do you get the moral excellence within your heart to be a follower of Jesus in the difficulties of marriage? Where do you get it? Does it have something to do with your connection to Christ? Being filled with the Spirit? Letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly? Does it have something to do with that? And so the first thing that we come to, the first realization that we come to is that my, my marriage has to be anchored in the rock Christ Jesus. Right? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so when you think about Jesus Christ being the truth, truth simply means reality. And that's what Paul's been pointing us to. Us being hid in, anchored in Jesus Christ we're, we're anchored in reality, the way things really are in heaven. And he wants that to be our experience here on earth. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? It is really an amazing thought that we can do relationships from that anchor point. Who's going to be moved if you're anchored in Christ? And so Paul prefaces both his letter to the Colossians his instructions on marriage, and his letter to the Ephesians, his instructions on marriage, with this reality that you need to be grafted into Christ. You need to be hid into Christ. You need to be walking in the Spirit. You need to really be enjoying your walk with God if you're going to do relationships in marriage in a God-honoring way. It has to be that way. And this is a great privilege that he has given us as clear instruction. And we can follow that instruction. Our personal relationship with Christ must be first and foremost. But what I want you to also notice is that Paul does something else. He does this every time when he's addressing a problem. It doesn't matter what the problem is. It doesn't matter if it's the immorality at Corinth or if it's uh, church issues at Antioch, wherever it's at. What does he do? He takes the gospel and he plants it. He plants the gospel of Jesus Christ right in the middle of the conflict. Do you ever notice how he does that? He puts the gospel right in the middle of the conflict. He puts the cross of Jesus Christ right there. 
There you are. You want to resolve conflict in your marriage. You want to resolve conflict in any relationship. You want to resolve conflict in the church. What do you do? You gather around the cross. You come to a deep realization that it is because of the cross that we have any hope of life, any hope of redeeming what we lost, any hope of being restored back to loving headship and willing submission. To restore again that image, that billboard that declares the love of God to a lost and dying world. That declares the gospel message to our children who sit around our dinner table. It's a cross. It's a cross of Christ. And so how does that actually work? Well, we talked about expectations in marriage. And um, I, as a young deacon in the church years ago, when I was called to serve as a deacon, I started getting involved in uh, doing a little counseling with marriages that were having problems. And all marriages have problems to work through. But, so I said, you know, I, I got I to figure out how to do this. This is, this is you know, there's got to be a, a, a secret to helping people get over their problems in marriage. And so I took a, I took a counseling course through American Christian Counseling Association. And, and basically it's like this. Um, we sit down with, let's say, uh, let's, just, let's just say Jack and Betty, okay? We sit down with them and we, we hear them out. They stress that you've got to give them plenty of time to talk about all their problems, all their frustrations. And so we give them lots of time. And then we take a piece of paper and you... Tear it in half, you say, hey, Jack, Betty, I want you to write down all the things that you want to see change in your marriage. And you know what would always happen? Jack would come up with a list of about eight or ten things that he wanted to see Betty do different. And Betty would come up with a, a list of eight or ten things that she wanted to see Jack do different. And we would talk about that, and then we say, okay, you go home, and the next time we get together, we're going to talk about how... It went. Got it? Is that a good way to solve marriage problems? And why not? What's wrong with that? Trying to fix the other... Wait, is that my responsibility? What we are doing is we are offering a counter solution that only makes problems worse in that we help establish expectations of the other person we put the blame and that's exactly what we see happening in the garden is it not so in, in genesis chapter 3 verse 8 adam and eve have made a, a, a an incredible mistake and they hear the voice of god in the garden and what do they do they hide and God shows up and says, what happened? What happened? Why were you afraid? Did you eat of the tree? And Adam says, that woman that you gave to be a helpmate, she's the one who gave it to me. You gave? So you get the point? He's blaming God that his wife isn't all that she should be. And he's blaming his wife for the mistake that she made. And Eve says, that serpent. She blamed the serpent. And so we are. That's how we live our lives. We blame our spouse for the when things are not the way they ought to be. We perceive that they're not the way they ought to be. And the gospel calls each of us to take personal responsibility for what God has called us to be. And for the husband, he has called it to be us to be what? Loving headship. And for the sisters, he's called you to be willing, submissive. Servants. It's all about servanthood. And the way we get there is we take our list of expectations and we put them where? On the cross. Thank you, brother. We put them on the cross. Jesus taught us that. He said, every day you must take up your cross. That means our expectations. Now, right now, I'm just going to ask you, you men who are married, are you committed to loving your wife that way? 
by taking your expectations and putting them on the cross and loving her as Christ loved the church. And we have to understand that the love that Christ loved the church with is what we call agape love. That means I give myself completely, entirely. I'll give my life for you without any expectation that there's going to be a return on the investment. That's how deep the love of Christ is. Regardless if there is no return on the investment, I still give myself completely to you. That is a deep, deep love. And one of the th- reasons why it's so important that we share this is because many young men do not understand the actual responsibility they're signing up for when they come to the, to the marriage altar. And what you're doing is you're not signing up to have your needs met, okay? You got that? You're not signing up to have your needs met. What you're signing up for, and I heard a young man say this to me. It was so refreshing. In in pre-marriage counseling, I say, why why do you want to get married? And a young brother said to me, he said, because I want to give the clearest possible picture of how much Christ loves the church. You know how refreshing that is? That is absolutely refreshing. What he's saying is, I've, I've thought this through. And this isn't about me having my needs met. This is about me fulfilling my purpose and mission in the world by suffering at whatever level I need to suffer in order that that billboard of my life might be flashing the truth regarding Christ's love for the church. So whatever level you are in your marriage, if you come to that realization, there is incredible blessing. Putting your expectations on the cross, and the same is true for the sisters, to take the expectations that you have of your husband, put them on the cross, and simply commit, no matter what happens, no matter what my husband does, I will be willingly submissive to my call from God to give a picture of Christ and his submission to his father. It started in Gethsemane. It ended on the cross. And it always does for us too. And so, in a couple thoughts that I want to share yet. I don't know what time. What time do you normally close the service here, Brother Ethan? Five minutes ago? Okay. I was at a church out in the Midwest, actually Northwest, and... When they were ready to quit, they just started closing their Bibles and laying them on the benches, okay? So, <laughs> all right, let's go. Um, don't, don't do that, please. <laughs> One thing I want to bring in, to, in here, we're in Ephesians chapter 5, and we are um, in verse 21. What in the world does verse 21 mean? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And I had a young sister tell me, she said, I read that verse, and she was she was wanting to be married. And she said, I read that verse, and I was so delighted because what I realized was that um, I don't have to do all the submitting. That sometimes my husband has to submit, sometimes I have to submit. And I said, okay, so how does that work? Just give me a practical way in which that works. When do, when do you... When do you submit? When does he submit? Well, he submits when I'm right. Okay. So what does this mutual submission mean? Uh, She's still single today. And I think it's probably a good thing. Um, Because that's not what this verse is talking about. Mutual submission. What does mutual submission mean? Okay, so let me explain it to you as I understand it. Mutual submission means this, that I submit myself to this reality that I am called to die to all my expectations and put my wife first. My wife is called to die to all her expectations and put her husband first. Does that make sense? That mutually, mutual submission to each other's needs. I'm worried about my wife's needs. She's worried about my needs. And you know what that is a recipe for? 
a God-honoring marriage. Where do we see that actually taught? Everywhere in Scripture. <laughs> Just let me give you one Scripture. We don't have time to turn to it because I got a sense that maybe we're running out of time. But let me let me just write this down, okay? You, you brothers, write this down. 1 Corinthians uh, 7. Okay, so what Paul is saying there is, look, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, we live in a wicked world. And so one of the ways that we find strength in our lives to be men of integrity, men of virtue, men of conviction, women of conviction, in a wicked world in which we live is what? Close, intimate relationships within the marriage. God has created us as physiological beings, and we're emotional beings. We, we, we think about things intellectually, and, so, and many times our sisters have a, a, a sharper intellectual perspective of things than what the husbands do, and, and happy is the man who recognizes that and who allows his heart and his life to be shaped by the intelligence that God has granted to his wife. His wife is probably more mature than he is in many ways. It's often the way it is in our relationship. My wife has a much more mature perspective of things than what I may. And happy am I when I enter into that. But the what Paul is saying is, look, you know what? To avoid the world and all of its corruption from encroaching upon this sacred thing that you have, this covenant that you have as marriage, you need to be very sensitive to each other's needs. And this is talking about the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. And he says it's a very precious thing. It's a very sacred thing. It's holy. It's ordained by God. And it actually brings your hearts together in a oneness that gives you a resistance to all the corruption that's out there in the world. You treasure that sacredness that God has given to you. And you recognize that the physical relationship that you share as a husband and a wife, just the gift of touch and being together and being close is actually an act of worship. Did you get that? In the sacred context of exclusivity of the marriage covenant, it is an act of worship. Everything about the marriage relationship reminds us of the kingdom of God and of our relationship with Christ. And what is it that we know about our relationship with Christ? There is not a thing that's hidden in your life. Did you know that? It's not a thought that you have that God doesn't know. The scripture says it very plainly that all things are naked and open before him with whom we have to do. So here's the concept. You're not saved because you're perfect. Is that right? No, that's not it. You're quite um, the opposite of being perfect. You're in the process of being saved, sanctified. But you're not saved based upon your performance or who you are or how clean your heart is even. It does have a lot to do with what you want to be and what you desire, your passion. But the point is this, is that God knows everything about you, the ugly, the terrible, and he loves you intensely in spite of it. The point is this, totally known totally loved. You got it? Let's say it together. Totally known, totally loved. This is a precious thing. It's a precious thing in marriage to be able to understand this and to live and to rest in this reality. Totally known and totally loved. And when a husband and wife are mutually submissive to each other, that is where their hearts rest. And that sacredness in their marriage that they share, that they defend with their very life, they protect it with their very life, reminds them that one day the most amazing, ecstatic thing that they will ever experience is when they stand before God and God puts, Christ puts his hand upon them and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's never a time in the 
human soul will never be more joy, ecstasy, than that moment when you experience that. We have a foretaste of that in our marriage relationship, in that mutual submission to one another in every area of life. And it is indeed, when it's in all purity, it is an act of worship that God delights in. Because it's just when you, as when you spend time communing with God, fellowshipping in the spirit, allowing his word to wash you and to strengthen you in the inner man, that's what happens in our marriage relationships when we love one another and are mutually submissive one to another. We want to protect it and keep it as that sacred thing in our marriages. I want to um, just close with a few thoughts. This marriage gift that God has given to us. Right now, wherever your marriage is at, if you take the simple principles that Paul lays out that Jesus Christ himself set the precedent for of taking your expectations to the cross of Christ and being committed to being what Jesus is to the church. That is your responsibility. You're committed to that. You will leave a legacy for your children. One of the deepest things that that hurts my heart is when I talk to young people who are getting ready to get married, and I'll say, what are you looking for in your marriage? And they'll say, we're not sure, but we know what we don't want. Well, what don't you want? I don't want a marriage like mom and dad have. And so I've been in ministry for I don't even know how many years. No idea. My wife could tell you. But that's a grievous thing to hear. And here's why. Uh, we, 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 we tend to create what we hate. And we tend to destroy what we long for. If we take the message of the cross out of our relationships. That's the way it is. It'll always be that way. You can't change that. It's the law of sowing and reaping. And if you really want something different than what you've seen your mom and dad experience, you're not going to get it by trying to be different from your mom and dad. There's only one way to get it, and that's to follow Jesus, to walk in his footsteps and to take up your cross. And to do that is a painful thing. It's not an easy life. You have to want to be fulfilling the purposes of God in your life more than you want what you think you want. We all want other people to look at us and say, wow, (laughs) that couple's got their act together. No, no. All those expectations, all those desires, all that ego, all that pride has to go on the cross. How do you how do you spell sin? Is that right? Did you get the point? Original sin showed up in heaven of all places. When Satan said, I will be like. Original sin showed up in the Garden of Eden when Eve said, I think I want to be like God. And when we want to create our own world the way we want it, our world revolves around me, around what I want, my expectations. You have to want what Christ has created you for, his purposes, more than you want anything else. The gospel has to become precious to you. You have to make that choice. But life is like You're like writing a story that other people are going to read and your children are the first ones who are going to read it. You're setting the precedent for your children in the life that you live and everyday choices that you make, the affections that you show to each other. You know, my mother and father had a lot of issues in their marriage. 
There's one thing that always stood out to me was that my mom would meet my dad at the door and hand him his lunchbox and give him a goodbye kiss before he went to work. And she met him at the door every evening when he came home and gave him a hug and welcomed him home. That's one thing I learned from my parents is that it's okay to be affectionate. A lot of, a lot of that generation, they weren't there. But my mom and dad were affectionate. They showed affection to each other. And that was a real blessing in my life. It's amazing to me how quickly um, this marriage journey moves along. And so soon you hear your children talking about you and your, and your wife, your spouse. And I remember when my father-in-law, he grew up in a generation where you didn't put your arm around your sons and say, you know, son, I'm, I, I'm so glad that God gave you to me to be a son. I hope you fathers do that, right? Do you do that? You communicate love to your sons in that way? Your daughters? Do you do that? Some generations they did, but I think all of you do. At least you're going to. Something awkward about the first time you do it. There you go. There you go. We had a good example right there. Yeah. But, you know, my father-in-law was in that generation where everything was kind of cold and stiff. You know, you just kind of like, you knew you were loved. And if you didn't, there's something wrong with you. I didn't have to tell you. Just, I mean, I put food on the table. What, what more do you want? That was the generation my father-in-law grew up in. But I knew I was loved because he invested in my life. And he would come to our house and he would, uh, the whole way from Iowa, sometimes for a week at a time and help me with whatever I was doing. But I remember there, there, when, when my father-in-law was 90, um, how old was dad when he died? 93 just short of 94 years old. Sharp, the mind was sharp as a tack. And I remember we had one last family gathering and we were all sitting. We knew dad's time was short. He was getting feeble. And we're all sitting around the family table. All the um, eight children and their spouses and grandchildren, great big table stretched out. And dad was sitting there at the head of the table with mom. And by this time, mom and dad they had so shared their life together, so laid down their life for each other. It was like two people. You couldn't see the one without the other. It's just like they were just two had become one. It's a journey to get there, but they, they had gotten there. And they were sitting there, and someone passed a cup of coffee to my father-in-law, and he picked it up with his trembling hand. And that coffee spilt down across his hand. It was hot. And my mother-in-law reacted as if she felt the pain. Just grabbed his hand and, and, and napkins and started, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay, sweetheart? Just that, you know, it was like they were so one that when something happened to the one, the other one felt it. And then somebody said, you know, I remember when I was a child. And someone else said, but when I was a little girl. And somebody else said, you know, back when I was 16 and for about, an hour and a half, there was just a spontaneous conversation that happened among the family. It was just like, you know, I, I didn't show up on the scene until a year before we got married. It was like a scroll of their life just kind of like peeling off before me. And I had little flashbacks of things that happened in their life when the house burnt. They lost everything except for the night clothes they had on their back. You know, they talked through all the experiences of life. And the one thing that stood out was dad always loved mom. He would have done anything to protect her, to care for her heart. There was never a time that we eight children could remember that Mom ever had a reason to feel that dad did not love her. He was sharp with those children sometimes, but not with mom. His words were always kind and gentle and affirming, expressing gratitude to mom always. It just really inspired me as I watched that. I realized, you know what, we're all writing a story. And our children are going to read our story. And our story is going to impact our children. It's going to shape their relationships. And this story goes on from generation to generation to generation. 
I remember when I was a, a boy. I don't know if I should take time to do this. I was a boy. I was probably uh, 15 years old, and I was thinking about marriage. <laughs> so some of you guys are probably thinking about marriage, right? Yeah. And one of the reasons I wasn't sure if I wanted to get married was because I figured, I, I thought about it long enough that I figured out that one of these times, you get married, there's going to be a parting. Okay, you got that? So there's two things. You make your decisions in light of the fact that you're here to represent Christ and his sacrificial death. That's what you're here for in your marriage. And you're here because there's going to be a parting. You make decisions in light of the fact there's going to be a parting. And you're writing a story for your children. And I picked up the family life one day, and there was this poem in there. And I don't know if I can even say it right now, but I might try. Just to see if if I can try your patience and see your Bibles are closed on the front bench there. So we'll try to make this real short. But um, the poem goes something like this. And and I say it to my, I used to say it to my wife a lot. Should you go first? And I remain to walk the road alone. I'll live in memory's garden, dear, of happy days uh, we know, we've known. In spring, I'll watch the roses red when fades the lilac blue. In early fall, when brown leaves call, I'll catch a glimpse of you. Should you go first, and I remain for battles to be fought, each thing you touched along the way. will be a hollow spot. I'll hear your voice. I'll see your smile, though blindly I may grow. The memory of your helping hand will bring me on with hope. Should you go first and I remain to finish with the scroll, no lengthening shadow shall air creep in to make this life seem droll. We've known so much of happiness. We've had our cups of joy. And memory is one gift of God. The death cannot destroy. Should you go first? And I remain for battles to be fought. To walk the road alone. Walk slowly down that long, lone road. For soon I'll follow you. I want to know each step you took that I may walk the same. For someday down that long, lone road, you will hear me. To call your name. And, and I've, I've seen it's a reality in the lives of those who've lived well together, who've demonstrated the grace of God in their marriage. They come to the end of life, they can hardly go on without their spouse. They become so much one flesh. And today, the little choices that we make in our lives to take up our cross, to die to ourselves, to take up our cross every day. Eventually, it gets us to that point where our marriage is such a precious thing to us. We recognize it for the incredible gift that it is from God. And we treasure it. Start when you're young. Plan for that day when you're young. It is worth it. I trust me. It is worth it. It portrays the glory that we will experience one day when we see our Savior. When he takes his bride, he brings his bride home. Thank you for your patience tonight. I'm sorry it went a little bit late. It took me a while to get going there. And so I hope that tonight you understand that God wants to prepare your heart to portray the gospel, to take his purposes forth into the world. And we want to be faithful in that. And the way we do that is by embracing the gospel message. Let's Do you kneel for prayer? Let's kneel for prayer. Father, we thank you for these moments that we can share together. And I thank you for this uh, lovely congregation of people. Thank you, Father, for those who uh, have experienced your grace in marriage. And just pray that you would bless them abundantly as they continue to press on in that relationship. I pray, Father, for the young people that are here tonight who look upon life with eager eyes and uh, are so easily sometimes sidetracked by the desires of one's own heart. And I just pray that you would uh, allow them to give those desires completely and fully to you and allow their hearts to be uh, molded and shaped by you that uh, 
uh, to the point that Jesus becomes all in all, everything to them. Just give, that, give each of us grace, Father, to take your word tonight and to apply it to our hearts and lives. Help us to go from here and to be better at loving the way Jesus loves. We love you. We trust you completely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christ is all and in all. That was, I guess that's a phrase that just been going through my head all through this um, service. It's, it's Christ, the cross. And I was blessed to be here and a very practical message. And my desire is to put to practice what we heard tonight. And I don't think there's probably not if you look at the Ones that raise their hands at 40 years, been married 40 years, I'm sure you would acknowledge there's things you can, you haven't attained either. For those that have been married less than a year, very good practical advice. I'm sure you can relate to many of the things because it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long in a marriage for life to show up. That cloud nine is, that bubble bursts pretty quickly, doesn't it? And we discover that life is life is real. So let's um, put to practice as God's God's word, how God instructs us. And um, very very good advice. Thank you, Brother John, for sharing. And I trust as young people as well. It's there was much there for for you. I'm going to open it up. Someone cares to share a testimony? Yeah, I just like to have a response from from you all if. Someone cares to share. <laughs> 